Hi everyone, I'm Ellen Casey. I'm a sports medicine physician at the Hospital for Special Surgery, and I am honored to be joining my two colleagues and friends, Dr. Marcy Faustin at UC Davis and Dr. David Cruz at the Orthopedic Specialty Institute in Orange County um, to speak with you all about USA Gymnastics pandemic and progress. We have no disclosures for this talk, but I did want to um, say that Dr. Foshlin was really the inspiration in putting this talk together. She gave a similar talk at her institution, and it was so well received. We wanted to um, bring this um, to the lecture series during the Olympics, and she was kind enough to let Dr. Cruz and I um, join with her and put this together as a product for you. Our objectives for this talk are to do a very brief um, introduction to the structure and the organization of USA Gymnastics, and then talk about how during the pandemic, how we responded as a medical team, as well as an organization in particular, um, in supporting and acknowledging the social justice movement, and certainly um, highlight how increased awareness of the sexual abuse in our sport has influenced cultural change. And that is certainly an ongoing process as well. If we think back to the roots of gymnastics, um, there's, you know, the earliest mentions in uh, history go back to ancient civilizations, particularly Greece, where uh, the very first vaulting um, event took place with a live bull um, and vaulting over uh, that animal, as you can see in the picture here. And then in the 1500s in Italy and 1700s in England, gymnastics type movements were used as a form of medicine. So we can liken um, gymnastics maybe to a very early rehabilitation protocol. Um, so, you know, we certainly have some interesting history as a sport, both in the, the athletic world as well as in medicine. Some additional uh, pieces of the timeline I think that are worth mentioning. In 1881, the Federation of International Gymnastics, or the FIG, was founded. Um, this group is the overarching governing body for gymnastics worldwide. Um, so they make decisions based on policy, rules for different events, and every four years, um, basically the, the code of points is changed to sort of drive um, different changes in technique and skill elements. Um, so they have a huge hand in the, the shape and trajectory of the sport. In 1936, gymnastics was first um, uh, made part of the Olympic Games. And then in 1970, USA Gymnastics, which is the national governing body, um, you know, which we are part of, formed. When people think of gymnastics, I think, you know, most in most cases, they're thinking of artistic gymnastics, of which we have a men's and women's division. But certainly rhythmic gymnastics is a popular uh, discipline. And so that uh, involves multiple different types of equipment, um, such as what you see here, the picture with the uh, gymnast and the ball. But there's ribbon, clubs, hoops, um, lots of different events there. Tumbling and trampoline, you can see in the two pictures in the bottom of your screen. Um, so that uh, is a very exciting sport to watch. Um, from a medical perspective, there's a lot of more acute trauma that you can see um, in those events just due to, you know, the significant height and um, complexity of the movements they're doing on trampoline. Acrobatic is a fairly new discipline and that's done in pairs. So it's kind of a combination of, of dance and, and strength elements. And then parkour is the newest discipline, which was added around 2019 um, that falls under the umbrella of USA Gymnastics. This is a busy slide and certainly don't need to take in all the details. We want to give you somewhat of a structure for the office or business organization of USA Gymnastics, which is spearheaded by Lili Leung, who is the CEO. And then from a medical perspective, um, we um, have a, a new addition, a relatively new in 2019, the position of Vice President of Athlete Health and Wellness was formed and Kim Krantz has been in that position since its inception. And Dr. Cruz was also appointed the Medical Director of USA Gymnastics at that time. The two of them uh, lead in a group of um, some of us uh, in an Athlete Health and Wellness Council that looks sort of at overarching um, themes and needs for athlete health and wellness um, for the entire organization. And then as you can see, each discipline has its own medical team with physicians, uh, usually physical therapists and athletic trainers um, that fall um, within this umbrella of organization for the medical team. 
From the perspective of women's artistic gymnastics, here's a picture of our core team. So Dr. Faustin and myself are the co-team physicians. Uh, Cheryl Thomas, pictured here, is a physical therapist. Um, sometimes we bring in athletic trainers to um, add into the team, depending on how many athletes we have. And our role is to provide care for certainly the athletes, but also the coaches and the staff, primarily at camps, competitions. But as you all know, there's a lot of work to be done in the interim period between those events. So uh, we try to facilitate, obviously, providing care when we're with the athletes and then facilitating care and um, collaborating with their home medical team so that we have a seamless transition of care from going from camp to home to back to camp or a competition. The men's artistic gymnastics medical team is, is a fairly similar to the women's. So uh, there are team physicians, um, physical therapists, athletic trainers providing uh, care during and, and uh, between these events. A little bit different for the men's team, though, is that a good number of the national team are tra often training and living at the USOPC in Colorado Springs. And so um, there is maybe a little bit more um, you know, continuity of care with the USOPC staff, certainly um, between events as well. So these are some pictures from men's and women's camps. Um, what's interesting about, and probably similar to many NGBs, but the way that this works is we have a fairly semi-centralized program. So some of the men are training and living together all the time, but there are men at you know, their own institutions, universities or clubs, um, you know, training elsewhere. From the women's perspective, for the most part, they're training at all different gyms with different coaches across the country. But the semi-centralized part is that they come together for camps um, roughly every four to six weeks. And then we use those as training time. Um, sometimes they're used as verification to show where you have um, are in your progress or even qualifications to get on um, teams for world championships, for example, or um, some major international competitions. And we do have the junior and senior national team um, usually together at, at the camp. So it can be quite a few athletes at any given time. The major domestic competitions that we are not only delivering care to our athletes for, but, you know, creating um, and organizing the medical care for the entire event um, run from Winter Cup is, is now kind of the first event of the season. Um, U.S. Classic and National Championships happen every year. Olympic trials only in an Olympic year and then obviously Olympics and World Championships when those uh, when those come up. And so a couple pictures here just to highlight. Um, so oftentimes this is the, one of the few times we're all together, especially men's and women's staff. So we'll use this time to run through emergency scenarios and how to you know, appropriately extract people, make sure we're, uh, you know, our plans are up to date and how we're tackling any medical issues that can come up. We often will do um, lectures for each other. So um, you may present uh, some research that you've done to the group or go over a common topic. You can see the picture at the top. We're using Dr. Cruz's shoulder to demonstrate musculoskeletal ultrasound. So these are really um, busy, exhausting, but really wonderful experiences for the medical staff each year. And these are just a few pictures from international competitions. So the top two were, were from um, 2019 World Championships in Stuttgart, Germany, where we all, uh, most of us got to be together and, and provide care um, in that setting as well. And so, as we mentioned, the point of the, this talk is to really focus on what was our response and how did we deal with our um, medical staff and our athletes and everyone else during um, the pandemic. And so, you know, no, none of us will ever forget what it was like in, in March and April and trying to think about what does this mean for our athletes and, and the, you know, all of these events that we were anticipating coming up. So this is just a quick snapshot of the USA Gymnastics 2020 schedule. We got all the way through hosting the American Cup, which um, is a, a, a pretty big international competition for men's and women's artistic gymnastics. That was in the beginning of um, March. Um, and it's funny to look back to, you know, at that time we were aware certainly of COVID-19 um, and we had our, you know, emergency action plan in place and how we were going to deal with um, any athletes or anyone with symptoms. But, you know, when we look at that protocol, the questions were, have you been to China recently? Have you been near anyone that's been to China? And, you know, such a different 
um, way that we're obviously handling and and thinking about you know risk for COVID exposure or infection at this point in time. So certainly a lot of learning has happened uh, since that point, but that's where we were when all of you know these things were changing. And certainly March 24th, we won't forget that date um, when the decision to postpone the Olympics. Um, was released and just thinking about uh, from you know our, our medical staff's perspective, thinking through you know what does it mean for our athletes? I'm sure like many other sports, there were lapses and interruptions in training that um, were longer than these athletes had ever encountered previously. Um, also, there were, you know, since our athletes are spread across the country, some never had their gym shut down and some shut down for months. And so the inequity in the access to training and, and the concerns that athletes and coaches had about that was very real. From a gym women's gymnastics perspective, because the year um, was going to be different for the Olympics, more athletes then aged in to be eligible for the team. And, you know, that certainly created some concern and uncertainty um, amongst our athletes and thinking of what that meant for their ability to qualify for the Olympic team. And we had a lot of conversations about what our role should be or, or could be during this time. Um, we focused a lot on education and we'll talk more about those initiatives and, and connection, not just amongst ourselves as the medical staff, but also with the athletes and, and you know, the coaches and the, the NGV staff as well. Um, so with that, I want to transition over to Dr. Faustin, who's going to take up the second part of the talk. Um, but before doing that, I just wanted to certainly say thank you to Dr. Finoff and Amber and all of the USOPC staff um, who have really enabled us to prepare to um, deliver care at uh, in Olympic Games in, in a pandemic. And we know it's been a huge effort and we very much appreciate all of the guidance and assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Now let's move on to athletes and mental health. Let's look at the epidemiology of the general population. And these numbers come from Kessler et al. from the Archives of General Psychiatry in 2005. They found that the rates of anxiety were about 28%, with adolescents ranging from 10 to 30%, while the rates of depression were 16%, with adolescents ranging from 8 to 11%. Now we know these numbers are likely to increase during this pandemic. But now let's look at the consensus statement from the International Olympic Committee in 2019, looking at mental health in elite athletes. Elite athletes meaning collegiate, professional, or Olympic level. What they found was that within team sports, there was about a 45% rate of anxiety and depression and a 5% rate of burnout or adverse alcohol use. Within individuals, this ranged from five to 35% over 12 months. And now for collegiate athletes, this ranged from 10 to 25% of depression. Embedded within that are the eating disorders. Now the International Olympic Committee also released the Sport Mental Health Assessment Tool 1 and the Sport Mental Health Recognition Tool 1 towards better support of athletes' mental health. This came out in 2020, and the goal was to create these screening assessments, not just for the medical professionals, but also for coaches, athletes, and family members. Now, a lot of us are well informed with these as we had to review the athlete history profile for our Team USA athletes. The American Medical Society for Sports Medicine, or AMSSM, also released their consensus statement. And this was led by my mentor, Dr. Cindy Chang, who was the Chief Medical Officer of London 2012 Olympics. It was entitled, Mental Health Issues and Psychological Factors in Athletes, Detection, Management, Effect on Performance and Prevention. And this was published in October of 2019 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Not only did they look at the competitive athletes of collegiate, Olympic, and professional level, but they also looked at the youth athletes. And what are the ways as we, as medical professionals, can assist with the detection and the treatment of these psychological issues within athletes? You can see to the right here is the table of context. And I know you can't see all the details, but I just want you to gather the breadth of topics that were addressed such as hazing, bullying, depression, suicide, and overtraining. The US Olympic and Paralympic Committee has dedicated their time, resources, and energy to supporting the mental health of all the Team USA athletes. And we know they can't accomplish their goals alone, and so we know it's there to support their families, friends, and the coaches. Michael Phelps has used his enormous platform to normalize mental health and seeking out treatment with speaking out about his own vulnerabilities and sharing his story. 
He released a documentary, The Weight of Gold, on HBO in July of 2020, which featured various Olympians, such as Michael Phelps, Apollo Ono, Sasha Cohen, and Gracie Gold. It looked at their journey to the Olympics and what it looked like afterwards. It also highlighted the deaths by suicide of Stephen Holcomb and Jarrett Speedy Peterson, who were Winter Olympians, to show us the critical importance in focusing on supporting the mental health of athletes. In September 2nd of 2020, the USOPC announced their first ever mental health ambassadors and philanthropic support of mental health initiatives. During that time, Dr. Jessica Bartley was hired as the Director of Mental Health Services. She has a doctorate degree in clinical psychology with an emphasis in sports and performance psychology and behavior therapy. With her leadership, they've created a 24-7 crisis hotline. They have staff mental health practitioners and a network of treatment centers nationwide. And to the right, on May 24th of this past year of 2021, Karen Kogan moderated a webinar aimed at looking for mental health advocates within the sport. This featured Stephen Glockstein, who was a trampolinist, Sam McCulloch, a men's artistic gymnast, and Jessica Renteria, an acrobatic gymnast, all national team members amongst many other accolades. They share their journeys and the ways that they've overcome their own personal struggles and continue to be mental health advocates. So what did we do? As a medical staff for the women's artistic gymnastics, Dr. Casey and myself, we split up the national team and the elite level athletes. Ourselves, along with Cheryl Thomas, our physical therapist, and Andrea Goldberg, our prior athletic trainer, we created many different Zoom calls with athletes, parents, coaches, USA Gymnastics staff, and even other medical professionals that help care for these athletes. Now, as we remember in the beginning of Zoom, we used to have unlimited minutes, and then they got smart and put that 40 minute cap. What we found was in some of these meetings, we were repeating meetings over and restarting a meeting over and over again, two or three times. This told us that the athletes and the parents and all the other individuals, they needed the support and we were happy to fulfill that for them. We also looked at how do we help and support all of the national team members of the various disciplines. We sent out a letter to them, reminding them that we are here to help support them. We also created a USA Gymnastics, a mental health information sheet. Now, as we know, when we see mental health in clinic, even if you see a high quantity of these, we know that they are difficult conversations. We wanted to make sure that all the medical professionals felt comfortable with dealing and having these conversations, and especially knowing these red flags. When does something need to be escalated? During that time, Headspace became free from all medical professionals, and Insight Timer, a meditation app, was also available to the public. And we know the USOPC did tremendous work to help support all of the Team USA athletes. Pictured here again is Karen Kogan. She is the senior sports psychologist at Colorado Springs. And they released many different documents to help support the Team USA athletes and the coaches. Some of them entitled Coping with Competition Cancellations or Postponements in the Age of Coronavirus, or looking at different virtual resources to stay connected in a time where we had to be physically, socially distanced. And when it was time to start our return to gymnastics, we wanted to make sure that the athletes were safe. We know that the fear among us as medical professionals is how do we prevent injuries? And so we created a PowerPoint and we sent these to the coaches, the parents and the athletes to discuss different ways of returning to gymnastics safely. We wanted to also give resources to help guide not just the national and elite level athletes, but all of the members of the USA Gymnastics. With the leadership of Dr. David Cruz and Kimberly Clans, along with the medical teams for all the various disciplines, the Athlete Health and Wellness Council, program staff and coaches, together we published a physical and mental health guidance for safe reintegration of gymnastics after COVID-19 restrictions from training. This looked at following an eight week return back to sport program with the goals of decreasing our risk of injury. Along with the member club considerations featured here on the right, we wanted to make sure that we could help support these clubs and how do we get them to be safe to return to the gym and to sanitize the gym while also keeping the athletes safe. For example, how do we keep the bars clean but make sure that the gymnasts will not come off the bars and can keep themselves safe. Now let's transition to a more difficult topic. As most of us know by reading the news, especially last summer, 
the injustice to the black and brown people of not just America, but the world had been brought to light, although it has always been present. The police brutality has brought unimaginable fear to the black and brown community. From the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery while running, the greater than eight minutes excruciating video of the death of George Floyd, or Breonna Taylor's life, whose tale was taken from her while she was sleeping in her own bed. And last, but definitely not least, Jacob Blake, who was shot in his back seven times while getting in the car with his, with his three young kids watching. And we know there are many other countless stories of individuals who've been affected, but their stories unfortunately do not make national news, but have great impact to their communities. The world had had enough and the, hang the anger has fueled this movement for change. Pictured here are Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tometi, who created the Black Lives Matter movement in 2013, which is an organization advocating for nonviolent social movement. It came to fruition in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, who was killed while walking home from a convenience store in a hoodie and with candy in his hand. He had no weapon on him. Now, these women were pictured here in the Time Magazine in September of 2020 as one of the 100 most influential people. Now, how are the USA Gymnastics athletes affected by this? They are no different than the rest of the world. And we know that before they are athletes, they are people. So what we know is that representation matters. Pictured here are very prominent black women who have paved the way for the women that have come behind them. First here to the left is Diane Durham. She's the first black American artistic gymnast to win a US national championship in 1983. She just passed away this past February of 2021 and was recently inducted into the USA Gymnastics Hall of Fame. Next is Betty Okino. She's the first black woman of any country to win a world championship medal. She was also a 1992 Olympic bronze medalist. Then there's Dominique Dawes, the first black woman to win individual medal in an Olympics and the first to win an Olympic gold. Among many other accolades, she also won all of the events and the all around at the 1996 Olympic trials and is a three-time Olympian. Then there's Gabby Douglas, the first black individual Olympic all-around champion and the first U.S. gymnast of any background or ethnicity to win individual and all-around gold in the same Olympics, London of 2012. Now, pictured below are the national team athletes from 2019. As we can see, we are starting to see representation of those athletes that want to inspire those that will come behind them. Pictured here to the right are these four athletes that I traveled with in 2019 for the inaugural Junior World Championships in Hungary. As you can see, three of these athletes are Black or African American and one Asian American. This was exciting to see. I'd be remiss to not talk about the greatest gymnast of all time, Simone Biles. Not only is she the greatest gymnast, she's arguably one of the greatest athletes of any sport of all time. And she has more world championship medals than any other gymnast. We know she has countless Olympic medals and skills that are named after her that some of the men cannot even perform. And then there's also Jordan Childs, who is a current Olympian and inspiring young black and brown girls all over the world. What I'm most excited about about this picture is that the way that they have represented themselves and that they have inspired each other to reach high and to accomplish these goals. And we look at the Olympic team just named at Olympic trials just a few weeks ago. You can see that the diversity is embedded within these teams and this is exciting. Last summer was a difficult summer for many of the different communities, especially those of the black and brown community. And so what we wanted to do as a medical community is to provide support for these athletes and let them know that we are thinking about them. We sent this letter to all of the women artistic national team athletes. I know you can't read all of the details, but I'll read you a small portion. We know many in the gymnastics community have experienced discrimination firsthand. It is a public health crisis that not only affects those of you directly, but touches many of you indirectly as you watch your teammates and friends fight for their human rights just because of the color of their skin. We see you, all of you. We grieve with you and hope for the better tomorrow. And we ended it from a quote from the great Maya Angelou. If one has courage, nothing can dim the light which shines from within. 
USA Gymnastics as an organization also took a stance to help support this movement. They participated in Blackout Tuesday on June 2nd, 2020. They have a page dedicated to the diversity, equity, and inclusion ni initiatives with such things as implicit bias and staff and leadership training. And pictured here to the right was a petition that was placed because within the 100 plus historically black colleges and universities within the United States, not one of them has a gymnastics team. And then USA Gymnastics also put out various webinars looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion and bias within gymnastics. It featured prominent figures within the sport and those that have helped to inspire and change the sport. Not only did it look at race and ethnicity, but it also talked about sexual orientation. And we know that in the community in the past few months and really over the past year, that Asian American and Pacific Islanders have experienced significant discrimination. From March of 2020 to March of 2021, about 6,600 anti-Asian hate crimes were submitted to the STOP AAPI Hate Reporting Center. 65% of those came from females. So let's talk about what the athletes of USA Gymnastics and the national team did to inspire the world. Picture to the left is Morgan Hurd. She's a 2017 all-around world champion. She's a 2018 world championship team gold medalist and a two-time American Cup champion, among many other accolades. In April of 2021 in New York, she spoke out at one of the protests and it was a powerful speech if you have a chance to review that video. And then to the right here, we have Yo Maldar. He's a current Olympian here in Tokyo with us. He's a 2017 national champion and a 2017 world championship bronze medalist on the floor. Yul posted about an incident and when a woman yelled to him, go back to China. He then posted on his social media, when I put USA on my chest when I compete, it hurts to know that I have to re represent people like that. He is using his platform to bring awareness about the Asian hate that has been going on and the changes that need to occur. Pictured below is a webinar that he had done with the USOPC in April of 2021. And us again, as a medical community, we wanted to be able to help support the gymnasts and sent a letter of support to them. On the bottom here, you can see that there are various resources for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community. It has been difficult to watch the discrimination occurring against transgender athletes. In 2021 alone, there have been more than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced in the state legislation. Not only are there barriers trying to be placed to offer gender affirming care, but also to create further disparities in receiving just basic medical care. We know the toll that it takes on these individuals, the mental health and the effects that it has on their families, friends and their communities. USA Gymnastics is being an ally and has taken steps to let all persons, athletes and individuals know that they're seen and they get to be their true authentic self. In November of 2020, a 14 page document was released with updated policies for transgender and non-binary athletes for non-national team athletes as those would follow the IOC rules and policies. Such changes included that transgender athletes no longer needed to apply to participate in the discipline that aligns with their gender identity. They offer, also wanted to offer educational resources in order to create a more informed community. And let's talk about the power of athletes. The sports world took a strong and loud stance in response to the Jacob Blake shooting by a police officer. On August 26, 2020, the Milwaukee Bucks of the National Basketball Association, or the NBA, boycotted their playoff game against the Orlando Magic. This influenced many other leagues to follow suit, with the Women's National Basketball Association, WNBA, Major League Baseball, MLB, and Major League Soccer, MLS, to all boycott their games. It was truly an unprecedented day. The athletes reminded the world that they are humans first and they will continue to fight to better the lives of those around them and inspire change within this world. And one of those positive changes was that the NBA arenas were used as polling centers for the 2020 election. And now I'd like to transition to Dr. David Cruz. Hi everyone, I am uh, Dr. David Cruz, uh, medical director for USA Gymnastics and the men's artistic team physician. Uh, I'll be speaking to 
topics of awareness education and the future. Uh, but first, I want to uh, thank Dr. Casey and Faustin for uh, their collaboration and trust and leadership throughout this past year. Uh, they have been amazing partners uh, in this uh, journey. When we speak of abuse, uh, there are many general categories uh, that can be referred to uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, uh, exploitation, neglect, and abandonment, uh, all he having equal importance uh, in that conversation. Of course, in sport, uh, we can also speak to our safe sport code. We have a robust uh, oversight now um, highlighting the different categories uh, that are important uh, between emotional and physical misconduct, bullying, and hazing all of which uh, also have uh, equal importance and uh, different aspects within each category that we all need to be aware of. Um, in 2016, uh, survivors uh, detailed their accounts of the abuse suffered at the hands of Dr. Larry Nasser. Uh, this happened, of course, in his time with uh, USA Gymnastics and at Michigan State University. We also learned uh, during this year um, other uh, instances uh, with coaches within the sport of gymnastics and uh, other uh, cases of abuse and uh, forms of abuse. Uh, but because of the uh, courage and um, resilience of these survivors, uh, they were collectively awarded the Arthur Ashe uh, Courage Award. And this uh, brought a lot of additional awareness uh, to this movement and to the uh, need uh, to make change and um, brought on uh, further um, work uh, in this uh, uh, arena. In uh, 2018, uh, during uh, Dr. Nassar's trial, uh, there was an unprecedented opportunity uh, to um, provide a, a platform uh, for the survival uh, survivors to um, account uh, their episodes of, of abuse. And um, through these, uh, these impact statements, it really demonstrated uh, courage, provided an opportunity for empowerment, showed uh, tremendous resilience, and really encouraged a uh, pathway forward uh, for all of us uh, in how to tackle these issues and uh, continue this uh, work um, at many different levels. And really the next uh, important step in that was the dissemination of information, uh, really with uh, continuing to provide a uh, voice for everybody and uh, to pro promote that uh, change. Uh, that dissemination uh, took uh, uh, many forms uh, between um, uh, TV shows, uh, podcasts, social media, uh, book publications, uh, and uh, many of us, um, Remember uh, also the impact um, initially that uh, the NPR documentary uh, Athlete A uh, had. You know, many of us uh, watched that, and um, it just brought a different level of awareness and detail to um, how uh, these levels of abuse uh, occurred and all of the changes that we needed to make uh, individually and systemically. Uh, through that systemic change and through that uh, building awareness, um, there was uh, work done internationally, and it brought uh, an opportunity for uh, voices in other countries between uh, Great Britain, uh, Australia, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, uh, different gymnastics federations and different athletes uh, seeing that they had a platform and a voice and could speak up. Uh, to different uh, types and levels uh, of abuse um, outside of sexual abuse, but also emotional and uh, various uh, forms of physical abuse. Uh, this uh, brought uh, a serious uh, recognition and change, um, even at the level of uh, different federations, um, uh, threatening to uh, shut down full programs. Um, the Dutch uh, Federation uh, demanded a significant change within their women's artistic program. But I think what needs to be highlighted also that um, a lot of this uh, change and motivation was through the accountability of not only um, 
the uh, organizations, but also the individuals. And uh, a lot of this change uh, came on through uh, those who um, took part in the different levels of abuse, uh, taking that accountability. And uh, that came in the form of uh, various coaches and within the Dutch Federation, uh, some uh, coaching uh, um, uh, voices that uh, really stepped out stepped up and took accountability for uh, the systemic changes and cultural changes that needed to be made, really in support of uh, the survivors and uh, their voices. And out of that um, also came uh, different levels of accountability. And, um, you know, even within uh, our, our specialty, you know, I think um, we need to recognize that the years of sexual abuse by Dr. Nassar really came um, in the context of the medical space and really in our home of uh, sports medicine. And uh, this really prompted uh, the first uh, public address uh, from physicians at a national platform with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tangi's talk at the 2019 AMSSM annual meeting. This was a uh, um, keynote um, talk uh, that was also accompanied by a um, speech by uh, Jordan Weaver that was uh, very moving and very emotional for many of us there and uh, really prompted uh, and mobilized us to make uh, some of those changes. Uh, Dr. Tanji's talk was uh, very powerful and uh, highlighted uh, many systemic changes uh, in objectives that we should look at as uh, sports medicine physicians. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it raised really the questions about the integrity and behavior of uh, some sports medicine physicians and um, their uh, opportunity to take advantage of their, um, their power and their role uh, within our specialty. Uh, he um, prompted us to take another look at our medical and uh, social uh, contract that we have with our athletes and our patients and acknowledge that that social contract was um, broken and, uh, and lost and uh, really encouraged us to take a genuine approach uh, to start the process of repairing and uh, strengthening uh, that contract moving forward and really uh, acknowledging that uh, we all needed to take ownership in that um, uh, individually and, and within the organizations that we uh, work uh, this also prompted a lot of uh, change uh, and um, and leadership as well, uh, and uh, through the AMSSM and the leadership of uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, Kuntz, um, the uh, working group uh, developed a position statement on sexual violence in sport, uh, and uh, through uh, USA Gymnastics Athlete Health and Wellness Council and leadership of Dr. Rillian Nativ. Uh, we, as uh, USA Gymnastics, uh, was the first uh, NGB to endorse this uh, statement. And um, I think that's uh, something that the uh, Athlete Health and Wellness Council was uh, very proud of. Um, and then just the start, again, of, uh, of acknowledging uh, the, the work and uh, the things that we need to recognize um, there was a tremendous support within USA Gymnastics to do this, um, and that's really within their uh, work overall as an organization and as an executive team, uh, leadership team. Um, out of that work has come various uh, uh, publications and statements. Uh, this is an example, the uh, Athlete Bill of Rights that was developed um, to try and uh, define that infrastructure um, and uh, bring a level of uh, respect and accountability and uh, really provide uh, more structure to um, athletes' voice and um, really highlighted our, our key mission and values of safety, integrity, accountability, transparency, and really listening to athletes in their voice. Uh, and that uh, really is an extension of a lot of the work that we're trying to do uh, from a strategic standpoint moving forward uh, both um, from a uh, athlete performance and um, helping athletes uh, be uh, successful, uh, but also uh, in the arena of um, health and wellness. Uh, the uh, USA Gymnastics uh, Athlete Health and Wellness Council uh, is really trying to take up this work. Uh, that council uh, was developed uh, 
uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, it's led by uh, Dr. Kim Krantz, our um, chief of athlete wellness. Uh, within that council, we have uh, medical staff members from all of our different programs. We have uh, athlete representation from our athlete council. Uh, we have program representation, uh, and we also felt it was important to have uh, in, um, a independent uh, representation as well. And um, we're thankful for Dr. Rilly and Nativ's uh, leadership in that. Uh, but as part of the high performance plan uh, that was developed uh, moving forward is our work uh, and future uh, goals for the Athlete Health and Wellness Council. Uh, and those really are broad um, in our work of continuing to build a robust uh, medical staff, uh, continuing to uh, find different ways to provide uh, resources for uh, athlete mental health, uh, provide uh, various educational initiatives for our medical staff, athletes, uh, coaches, uh, parents at many different levels, whether it's the elite level or club level. Uh, we really want to continue to work on uh, various different platforms and how we can promote our health and wellness uh, initiatives and uh, really want to use uh, this performance plan as a uh, platform for uh, future uh, research as well. Of course, uh, outside of what we can do as individuals or organizations, uh, a lot of this uh, awareness and work has been done at the highest levels, you know, through various uh, federal legislation and regulations uh, to provide that roadmap uh, moving forward as well. Just want to take a moment uh, to highlight some of the work uh, that our medical staff and organization has been doing uh, to try to push all of these initiatives forward. Uh, this is just a um, brief uh, list of a lot of the academic and policy work that we've been trying to do through the council. Uh, of course, a lot of us and a lot of NGBs put a tremendous amount of work into how to get our athletes back safely in our reintegration plan after the uh, shutdowns from the pandemic. Um, out of that has come uh, some surveys uh, that we've done through USA Gymnastics, and um, we are working on submitting that for publication in terms of um, the various impacts that it had on mental health, as well as um, injury uh, rates and um, injury uh, prevention. Uh, we've tried to continue to define and provide more infrastructure and accountability when it comes to our medical staff roles and responsibilities. Uh, we've taken work, um, taken up work in terms of uh, various policies. Uh, we were able to work uh, collaboratively with our international federation to develop uh, concussion policies as well as uh, various other discipline uh, medical response policies, such as um, trampoline extraction procedures. Uh, we've been trying to consolidate uh, the medical care that is provided at all of our sanctioned events. Uh, we are also working uh, to provide further collaboration and platforms um, internationally with our colleagues in uh, gymnastics through various uh, consensus uh, statements, as well as the formation of a um, international gymnastics Medical Association, and we'll have our uh, third meeting, um, hopefully, um, at uh, uh, the Tokyo uh, Games um, and uh, likely through a virtual platform. But um, it'll be nice to continue to uh, develop that collaboration internationally as we uh, further this work uh, moving forward. And, um, and, and certainly as part of the, the uh, initiatives in research, but also publication as we continue to expand uh, the medical knowledge uh, within our sport of gymnastics and how we can better care for these athletes. And of course, all of this work and this journey has brought us to 2021. Uh, we've all felt the uh, tremendous burden of a very front uh, loaded, heavy schedule as we've been trying to ramp up out of the pandemic and getting our athletes back safely and to the uh, peak performance in time for Tokyo. Um, I think uh, all the NGBs have just done a, a, a tremendous job uh, from what I've witnessed in various um, individual conversations with medical practitioners from other sports or through the OPC's work and uh, collaboration and meetings. Uh, we've all uh, just done uh, tremendous work to try to get these athletes to Tokyo uh, safely and um, to be successful. Uh, so we are certainly looking forward to uh, the games uh, coming up uh, here in the in the next few weeks, uh, as well as looking to the future in our strategic planning, uh, both in performance, but also, uh, and again, more importantly, in the context of this talk, uh, further things that we can do to promote 
uh, social awareness, cultural awareness, cultural changes, accountability, and um, responsibility that we have within our uh, medical specialty. Uh, again, I just want to uh, thank tremendously. I'm so grateful uh, for the colleagues that I have within USA Gymnastics and our medical staff and what they've done to really um, help rebuild that medical and social contract uh, within our organization and with the athletes. Uh, the, the work that they've done is nothing short of uh, amazing. I um, also want to thank uh, Kim Krantz for her leadership with our uh, athlete health and wellness, our council, and her uh, leadership within the executive team and the organization. Um, and um, I do want to take a moment to uh, acknowledge uh, the support and uh, trust uh, that the, uh, the organization and USA Gymnastics uh, executive team has, um, has provided uh, the medical staff in this work uh, moving forward. And, and I'm looking forward to uh, further collaboration in that. Uh, so thank you to Dr. Finoff and the uh, U.S. Olympic Paralympic Committee for the opportunity to share this talk. Um, we uh, uh, very much appreciate the uh, collaboration that we have with our colleagues within the OPC and the support. Uh, we couldn't do it uh, without them. Um, tremendously grateful for that and looking forward to uh, future collaboration and opportunities. Uh, there are some references uh, for this talk, and we're happy to uh, provide um, that information moving forward.